This is my friend Don Bainey, and uh, just to give you a quick intro, he did give me a little bio, but it was awfully sweet and, and tidy. I'm going to mix it up a little bit. He grew up in Great Town, and he's been a hustler from day one. I think he had to run 10Ks to get a lift from an uncle to get to the start of the Comrades Marathon, then run the Comrades Marathon. He was hustling, selling voice rolls in the taxi rank, ran out of voice, ran up to the shop, got more, got someone else to buy his voice, sell more voice rolls, get through school, come down to Durban to pay for tech, was, was selling cigarettes and bulletin out the back of his uh, motorcycle. Today he sits as number two in the Mr. Price group. And that's not just the Mr. Price stores, that's a multiple group of businesses, miladies, etc., yuppie chef, you carry on. And uh, they oversee thousands and thousands of stores, and he is number two, overseeing 12 other MDs. He's on the front, on the coal face of our economy, the ins and outs. He meets with the mayor. He's, he is very much involved and has a front row seat of what's happening in our nation. I'll tell you what, there's some exciting things he has to share. Most of all, he is a spirit-filled man passionate about Jesus and the kingdom of God. And he walks the talk. He has started and has sown much into the kingdom of God. On our eldership team, he's actually really unhelpful. When we feel called to sow something, he'll say, well, I'll say, well what did, figure did you have in mind, Donnie? And you'll wait to the very end and say, well, whatever the highest figure was amongst us, I felt we needed to just double it. <laughs> but he has lived a life of sowing generously. They started an organization called City of Disaster Relief, sowing into Somalia, into South Sudan, all over South Africa. Uh, where there are disasters, seeing the gospel taken out and food aid and people restored. And so they, they really do walk the talk. He's, he runs out of our church, men in business, an incredible ministry to help get guys back on their feet, inspire them, envision them. And, uh, and Donnie's family, his wife, here is, uh, his wife is here, hails 20, married for 26 years, three daughters, two of which are adopted out of a seriously tough, as infants, out of many thousand orphans, out of some of our toughest townships in this city. And so he walks the talk. Don Bainey, over to you, bud. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Jordi. And uh, I really am so incredibly excited and honored to, uh, to be um, sharing my message uh, with you this morning. And uh, the word that came right up front about expectation really just aligns so much with what I have on my heart, what I believe God has laid on my heart for, to share with, with all of you this morning. I'm so incredibly excited about the future and my hope and my prayer up until this point has really been that uh, that hope and excitement that I'm feeling uh, really rubs off onto you, particularly to the biz businessmen and women that as you go back into your places of work, uh, as you go back into your businesses, into your communities, communities to, to the church leaders that are here and everyone in ministry, that, that you take this message as well back to the men and women that you lead in, uh, uh, in, in the churches that, that you belong to. So this enthusiasm that I, I, I'm feeling, uh, I looked up the, the origination of the word. It comes from two words, the word in in Greek and the word theos. The Greek word in translated means within and theos means God. And so together, those two words means God within. And so uh, this manifestation of this feeling that I have, uh, God within, is something that I really hope will transfer onto each of you this morning and beyond throughout South Africa. Before I get onto that and the reason why I'm so excited, we'll come onto that in a moment, I want to share a story with you um, from, a, from a biography I read on Stalin. And um, this was uh, at the end of um, uh, the World War II had ended, and uh, it was about 1949. Stalin had started to get a bit of dementia. Um, so he wasn't quite right in the head. I don't think he was ever right in the head. But um, he used to get together for dinner every night at the Kremlin, and all of his Politburo members would sit around the table and they'd have dinner together. And uh, one, one of the uh, Politburo members uh, was walking down in the harbor the one day, and he saw a ship. He walked onto the ship, and he saw some boxes, he opened the boxes, and he saw some bananas in it. And he thought to himself, well, Stalin's getting old now, his teeth were starting to rot and fall out, and he knew Stalin loved bananas, so he, he ordered for a box of these bananas to send, be sent back to, to the table. Um, and uh, so at that night, lo and behold, they're sitting at dinner at the Kremlin, and Stalin sees the bananas, and he opens one, and he bites into it, and it's not ripe. And so he chucks it aside, he's angry, and uh, he grabs another banana, bites into it, and it's still not ripe. And uh, he has an absolute conniption, and he decides, you know, somebody needs to be punished for this, and he wants to find out who's actually responsible for this. And so um, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was uh, what the guy that was walking down in the harbor, he says, look, it was this guy who 
had a ship there, and you know, so they called this guy. And long story short, and they sentenced this uh, this uh, guy who owned the ship to hard labour up in a salt mine somewhere up in the northern Soviet Union. And uh, I couldn't help having a chuckle at that story that that poor guy was just wrong place, wrong time. And the reason why I wanted to share that story with you this morning is because, unlike that poor ship owner or banana importer, every one of us that is here today is not in the wrong place at the wrong time. In fact, even before you were in your mother's womb, God had predestined and preordained for us to be here for your place in Durban, for the business that you're in, for uh, the company that you're working in. And how do I know that? Psalm 139 verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in the book before one of them came to be. It's just an incredible picture there that there's nothing left to try and see. God has has preordained it for all of us. And I'm further reminded about when um, the Israelites were were exiled in uh, in Babylon. And Jeremiah writes to them in uh, in chapter 29, verse 4 and 5. And many of you will be familiar with this passage. He says, This says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles to whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. And then a little bit further on in in verse 7, it says, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Why? For in its welfare you will find your welfare. And I really feel like just the, the, the experience that we've all been through as South Africans over the past two decades of really state capture and just all the negativity and the corruption and, and all of that kind of stuff, um, sometimes maybe we feel like exiles in this place, like, like you know, we, just, we just don't belong and that things could be a whole lot better somewhere else, um, which is why so many of our friends and colleagues and family have left for, for, for other places. I recently read another book um, by uh, a guy called, many of you will know him, uh, Justice Malala. He wrote a book, highly recommended book, um, called The Plot to Save South Africa. And the book was centered around the early 1990s, and it was all around that period where Chris Harney was assassinated. I was in the army at the time, blissfully unaware that any of this was going on, uh, not even knowing what I was doing there. And yet I read the testimonies and the stories in this book of his with uh, Tokyo Sexuali and Cyril Ramaphosa and uh, F.W. de Klerk and, and Mandela all you know, behind closed doors trying to figure out how to prevent this country from descending into chaos and into civil war. It's an amazing story. And I couldn't help drawing a parallel as I read this book earlier this year that earlier on in 2024 that uh, this country was almost in a similar position. And if you cast your mind back to January, February, I talk for myself, but I think of the many conversations that, that I've had, many of us South Africans were in a very similar place. We were in a very, very negative place. And uh, I must say at the outset that I'm not into, I, I have no allegiance to any particular political party whatsoever. Uh, my, my, my goal is that there must be men and women that love Jesus in positions of power, that uh, fear Jesus, that his light is within them. So I'm not interested in what political party they belong to. But uh, there was a very real probability or possibility uh, in, in the early part of this year that there would be a coalition of political parties that, let's face it, wouldn't have been good for this country. It wouldn't have been good for the people of this country, for our economies, for business. And uh, there, was a, there was a very real probability assigned to that. The, the other probability was that, well, let the existing government stay in place because uh, as much as, you know, they call the past decade uh, the lost decade, um, uh, 700 billion odd rand of international money has flown out of this, uh, this country, uh, international money has left this country over the last decades uh, due, to, due to state capture. And, um, but, but many of us, most of us, myself included, well, was like, well, rather the devil that you know than the devil that you don't. And so hopefully just, you know, we can keep things. We know, we know the existing government. Let, let that uh, sort of, uh, you know, stay in place. Nobody would have thought, six, seven, eight months later, that we'd be in this amazing position, and this is where my excitement comes in, that we'd end up with a GNU that, for the most part, would be working together uh, as well as as what it has. And I also want to say again, I'm not being like an ostrich and putting my head in the sand and saying we ain't got no problems ahead of us. There's going to be some problems. But for the most part, um, and I think Cyril Maposa, actually, uh, he's at the United Nations in uh, in New York at the moment, and, uh, and he said this to them. He said that South Africa... Uh, with the government of national unity, has experienced its second miracle after the first one in the 1990s. And so, why am I excited? There is 
bunch of new ministers in new portfolios with new energy, all eager to make a difference. If you open the news, there's been more talk of public-private partnership um, in the news that we've seen over the past couple of weeks than we've seen in 30 years. In fact, we know that the government has said public-private partnership, which we know is going to be very good for this country. Um, it was a taboo subject for our government. It, it was a, a no-go zone. I read earlier this week a Bank of America survey conducted by Ipsos found that a record number of fund managers expect that the GNU is going to deliver meaningful reforms that should see the local market deliver an excess of 10% return uh, over the next year. Um, why is that important? Well, it's been delivering less than 2% over the past 15 years. Enthusiasm is, uh, is building. Consumer confidence is already at a five-year high. It's already at pre-COVID levels, above pre-COVID levels, in fact. It's up 10 points in the past three months, and it's up 20 points on 2023 already. The RAND is strengthening. Uh, many of the economists, the bullish banks, uh, were forecasting that it was going to be at about 17.12 by year end. I checked this morning, it was 17.10 already. Earlier this week, it was 17.06. This is great for inflation. They're predicting it's going to be at about... Um, yeah, um, look, that's a crystal ball. I actually won't go there. <laughs> GDP forecast. It's forecast to be 2.5%. Investec were saying uh, they expect it to be at 2.5% um, uh, in, in 2025. I'm not an economist, but I went on to um, chat GPT and I said, when last was our economy, uh, our GDP growth at 2.5%? Guess when it was? 2013. I then asked it another question. I said, well, what was our household consumption and expenditure growth in that same year? Guess what it was? 7.5%. Because these are numbers we haven't seen for decades. Load shedding hasn't been around for a while yet, and uh, uh, I guess that's why... Um, uh, and I think all the conspiracy theorists were like, wait until the day after elections, you're going to see their load shedding is back. Well, it hasn't been back. This is amazing. And I think it's one of the reasons why that GDP growth is forecast to be as high as what it is. How's this? Fuel prices have dropped three months in a row. It's about to come down a fourth time now. Um, currently at the lowest prices since uh, March of 2022. And when the next fuel price drop comes along, they're saying that if you have a 50-litre tank, the cost of filling that tank will drop by about 220 rand. Hey? More, more money for KFC there. Uh, inflation is now at 4.4%. It's at its lowest level since August of 2021. And uh, they, they're predicting that it'll be about 3.6% by year end. I personally think it'll be a bit lower than that. How's this one? Take-home pay in South Africa is above inflation growth for the first time now since 2020 after five consecutive months of improvement. That means that everyone who's earning money is earning more, the growth of that is more than what prices are rising. That's incredible. That means you've got more disposable income. And at the same time, there's chaos going on all over the world. Uh, America is not a great place to be right now. Um, the hatred and the division there is in the, in the run-up to their elections. Europe, the Middle East. Um, and I really believe that we're in the land of milk and honey. South Africa right now... Uh, <laughs> We're at, we're at the threshold of guys. I really believe we're at the threshold of something great for this nation. And just as in 1990, when God heard the prayers of the saints that saved this country from going into civil war, I really believe that we're in a similar position now in 2024, that God has heard the prayers of the saints. That's you and me and all of our brothers and sisters, millions of them around the country, that, uh, that uh, our prayers going before him. He's heard those prayers, guys. And... Uh, yeah, I, look, if everything I've shared with you up until this point is not enough, um, I was reading that uh, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa even met with Elon Musk on Monday on the sidelines of the United Nations, so who knows what's coming there. And if, and if you're still doubting, then the Springboks have beaten New Zealand more consecutive times since 1949. So, but the story that I want to share with you today is actually from uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14. And I'll read, for, and sorry, and some background to the story as well. Many of you will know the story, but um, uh, the Israelites were not allowed to possess any weapons. They weren't even allowed to have a blacksmith in case they forged weapons on their own, so they'd have to take their weapons to the, the Philistine, Philistine um, uh, people, to the blacksmiths to sharpen for them. And it says that the, the Philistine army was gathered up against Israel. And there were 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And it says the troops were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And uh, the, um, 
the reaction then from uh, uh, Saul, who was leading the Israelites, he was king at that time, was they went, the, the entire army went into hiding. It says they were hiding in caves and in cisterns, hiding, paralyzed in fear. And so we pick up the story now where, where all of the, uh, the, the Israelites now, the army, are hiding in caves and in cisterns and so on, from verse 1. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was saying in the outskirts of Gibeah, in the pomegranate cave, that's where he was hiding at Migron. And my question to the business people today, and to those in ministry, to take this message back to, to, to your people in, in business, is how many of you are procrastinating like Paul was by hiding in the cave? Knowing that there is a task ahead, but milling around and actually doing nothing about it. Frozen in fear. And it would be reasonable for us as South Africans, particularly South African businessmen and women, to be frozen in fear. After all, we've been through a decade, decade and a half of state capture. There's been corruption all around us. Uh, you know, no economic growth, uh, growing unemployment. It hasn't been great. And so I think many of us are stuck in that cycle of just being sort of frozen in fear. But I love the fact that Jonathan, he wanted to do something. He didn't have a plan yet. He didn't know what to do, but he just said to his servant, come, let's just go check it out. Let's go and have a look. Don't know what we're going to find, but let's go have a look. And uh, maybe we just gather some intel. Um, but the point I want to leave you with on this is that his decision was just to do something. Um, didn't know what it was. Lift that stone, lift your eyes to the horizon, and just to go and have a look. And then we pick up again in, uh, in, in verse 6 of the same chapter. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. And here's the clincher. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And so he started to go and have a look. And then his look started to develop into a little bit of a plan. And it might have been a faithful plan, but, but, but this is the big thing here, is that, that Jonathan had a revelation of who God was here and God's power. And I think so often we, we, we say, well, you know, God is all powerful, but what Jonathan was actually saying here is where there was one Philistine there or Philistines as many as sand on the seashore, the size of the problem is actually irrelevant because if God is God and God is who he says he is, then the size of the problem has no relevance here whatsoever, which gave him that confidence. And then we, we pick up the, uh, the story again in verse uh, 8 to 10 uh, and Jonathan says again to his poor servant, shame, this guy must have had faith. The, the servant. He says, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. And if they say to us, Wait, we'll come to you, then we will stand in our place, and we'll not go up to them. But if they say, Come to us, we will go up, and the, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us. And so I love the way now it started with, let's just go and have a look, uh, to hang on, uh, here's a plan. This is what we're going to do. It didn't start with a plan. It starts with going to have a look first. And so my encouragement, really, for businessmen and women is I think some of those neural pathways needs to be broken down. You know, we've come through two decades of a hard time where things haven't been working out well. But, you know, with all those facts I've just shared with you now, we're at the threshold of change. And uh, unless we now lift our eyes to go and have a look, to lift those stones, to go and have a look, we're going to miss out on what God has in store for each of our businesses. And then finally, I pick it up in uh, verse uh, 11 and 12. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of their holes. They have hidden themselves in. That's the caves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come to us, and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, and I love, look at how the, 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 the faith that he has and, and how it manifests in his words. Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. And note here again Jonathan's faith. He had a revelation of who God, God was. And th that faith was complemented by positive affirmation. It's the power of words, guys. I was reading uh, an, another survey earlier this week. Did you know that South Africans are the third most negative nation in the world? I think the first is Haiti or something like that. And Anyway, so we're just, by nature, really a negative bunch. Um, and how often do we speak negatively into our situations, into our government, into our country? And it's time to change that. It's time to, time to start manifesting that change in our faith uh, through our words. As Jesus said, faith can move mountains. And how much faith is there in, in your words, businessmen and businesswomen? Or are you speaking negativity? The story goes on from there, and the Israelites give the Philistines an absolute writing, and uh, they, they're given victory. 
And I believe we're in a season now where God is saying, guys, go and have a look. Get out from your hiding places. Step out from your opportunity, from, from your fear and from your unfruitfulness and your inaction and go and have a look. All of those uh, stats that I read to you earlier, each of those things on their own is, is powerful. It's a powerful tailwind for our country. But the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts. Guys, the, the fact that we've got all of those tailwinds coming together congruently all at the same time is something we haven't experienced in, 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 in this generation for our country. And so I hope that uh, as, uh, as businessmen and women, as you lift your eyes, that uh, in turn that your faith would be stirred and that you'd have a revelation of the power of God to develop a plan that will bear fruit and, and give you success. Revelations 8 verse 4 says, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before the hand of the angel. That uh, those um, saints that were praying in the early 1990s that I spoke about earlier, those are the same people, that's you and me and all of our brothers and sisters around the country. He's heard our prayers again and he's ready to act for this country, guys. And so finally, to close off, I want to read to you an extract from a writing that's a mouthful of a, of a title. It's called The High Return Activity of Raising Others' Aspirations. But it's an important title. The High Return Activity of Raising Others' Aspirations. Hopefully what I'm doing with, with each of you here today. It says this, At critical moments in time, you can raise the aspirations of other people significantly, especially when they're relatively young, simply by suggesting that they do something better or more ambitious than what they have, or what they might have in mind, like lifting your eyes and going to have a look. It costs you relatively little to do this, but the benefit to them and to the broader world may be enormous. And this is, in fact, one of the most valuable things that you can do with your time and with your life. And so, for the businessmen and women that have heard this directly, amazing, lift your eyes, go out there and make it happen. And for the men and women that are in ministry, go back to your churches and encourage your businessmen and women to lift their eyes and encourage them that their ambition might be something a whole lot more than what they'd been expecting. And who knows what Jesus has in store for them. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Amazing, Donnie. Champion.